The world's greatest basketball player says with a straight face, how about we go out and kick some alien butt? That in the first ever The Real MVP Movie Podcast, starting now. All right, a little history being made here with the first ever edition of The Real MVP Podcast. I'm Josh Kelman. I'm joined by my counterparts, Christy McDougall and Saul Bookman. And today we're going to be breaking down in our first ever edition uh, what's technically considered a sports movie. Although upon a rewatch of it, I, we're going to talk a little bit about how much sports is actually in Space Jam. The world's greatest athlete, Michael Jordan, teams up with the world's best loved cartoon character, Bugs Bunny. You won't believe your eyes. Pardon me, Mr. Jordan. Can I have your auto, auto, uh, your John Hancock? What's going on here? We need your help. There's a couple of things I want to talk about. One, why this is relevant. One, the as we record this, the finals are happening right now with LeBron James and his teammate Anthony Davis, who are both in the sequel, which is coming out. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then just this has been an interesting summer as we record this. Basketball went away. They weren't attacked by aliens like they are in this movie, but basketball sort of gets messed with in this movie. And that's kind of what has happened to us this summer. And this has very much been an interesting summer where a lot of people have rediscovered Michael Jordan via the Last Dance documentary. So we're going to take a time machine back to the summer of 1996 when this movie came out. I mean, 19, summer 1996, you're playing basketball somewhere. I mean, do you remember thinking that you were excited about this movie when it came out? I remember thinking, why? Even at that time? Um, I was like, well, Michael Jordan's going to be in a movie. But at that time, I had like what? There was like 15 different Michael Jordan, like behind the scenes or highlight video movies that had come out, like, uh, you know, a Michael Jordan um, up in the air or something like that. And so at the when when he did this with Bugs Bunny, I was like, uh, OK, we'll see how this goes. Yeah, I've only seen them, this movie one time to preface this, and that Same. was ninety six until and now. Again, say, and so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> no, I saw this in the theater, and I remember thinking this was a big deal. Kristen, do you have do you have any history with any of these people or animated things? Okay. So I was in diapers most likely when this movie came out, or quickly they're getting out of diapers. So you- so I said, don't know if I seven. saw it in the theater. I'd have to phone mom and see if I thought saw it in the theater. But I do remember watching it when I was younger. But I think as a kid, you're just you're enthralled with, yeah, yeah, okay, Michael Jordan, he's a good basketball player. But the Looney Tunes was a selling point for me. You know, the '90s as is a weird fad for those of you who weren't around for it, where a lot of people were wearing Tasmanian Devil stuff. Like the Looney Tunes came back in vogue. I can't remember exactly what year, but. For a while, this was like a thing that, at least at my high school, cool people were wearing Looney Tunes stuff. So this is in like a weird zeitgeist of pop culture where Michael Jordan, by far the biggest, you know, athlete in the world. It's still strange to me that, you know, Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny, now they had done some commercials together. They had done, they they did a Super Bowl ad with Bugs Bunny and the hair Jordans. You know, Jordan was known for his commercials in the 1990s, all his collaborations with Spike Lee. It's got to be the shoes, McDonald's. There's actually references in this movie to his all of his endorsement deals. But why isn't Michael Jordan in more movies now that you've watched this movie? Why is he not in more movies? Okay, I have an answer to start that. <laughs> Well, first of all, as I was actually thinking back on, okay, I just watched Space Jam. What did I take away from Michael Jordan's acting skills? Yeah. I thought, did he even, I don't, I can't even remember one line he even really said in Space Jam. Like, I don't recall his acting whatsoever. So I think your answer why he is not in more movies is because he's not a good actor. Well, I, I mean, I think the, the, the best acting he did in the entire movie was when he got attacked by the dog, got up, and went inside the house with his kids. That was the most natural it looked in terms of just like something you would probably see in everyday life in terms of his acting skills 
outside of that oh yes everything was it felt forced it felt really cliche it was just like oh man let's you just... probably do have to give him a little credit because i know so much of this done was done with the green screen i don't know how far back green screen productivity goes but i i would love to have been a fly on the wall watching him film definitely didn't age well scenes. that's for sure yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, that's one thing when I was watching it is obviously how hard has it, it has to be so hard to act next to nothing. You know, I've interviewed a few guys in movies, uh, name drop, uh, Samuel Jackson. I remember talking to him about when he was in the Tarzan movie. And I thought if, nobody has seen The Legend of Tarzan. I'm a party of one on that. But I remember just asking him, like, is it weird when you're trying to react to a, a baby elephant that's not in the room? And he said, well, it's no different than, you know, being in Star Wars and swinging a lightsaber that's not real at people that aren't there. But I do think, you know, this this movie doesn't do anybody any favors by trying to act in front of nothing. I mean, you got nothing to react to, nothing tactile in the room. He had to be, I'm assuming, just standing in a big green room of nothing with a bunch of handlers and a director and lighting guys and gaffers. So I, I think he was sort of set up to fail here uh, with this movie. But... There's just so much of this movie is him just look to your left, look at your right. We're going to place Michael Jordan on, you know, any select location and then give him the direction and he followed the direction. And I think that was the extent of Michael Jordan's acting in space. Yeah. Time. Right off the bat, we are already on a path of doom when we got R. Kelly in a kid's movie. <laughs> and I just was like, oh, I forgot about this. I believe I can fly. game over <laughs> however the soundtrack i thought was one of the better parts of the movie but it's a, yeah it's a super famous soundtrack i mean you, did you have the cd song i did have the cd i actually <laughs> had pretty much every song uh from even the one uh, the monsters anthem you know which the sons actually played for their intro in their 2017-18 season which was kind of cool so I yeah. would venture to guess that if you went into any given karaoke bar this Saturday and someone put on, I believe I can fly. Everybody knows the word. One of the more successful karaoke songs sung that night. Would, would people be excited about that though? Or would they, or, you know, would that get a groan from the room? Like, no, I think, I think, <laughs> I think I believe I can fly hits every generation differently, but I do think everyone kind of gets in their feelings when they hear it. Yeah, I think people the probably of, the right amount of alcohol in them, and I bet everyone would be singing the top of their lungs too. Yeah, I, I don't think people really associate that song with R. Kelly so much. Um, it's just funny that you know this is a kids' movie and he's in jail because of all that other crazy stuff. So um, I thought that was pretty funny starting off the the show. So that did not age well. No, and that that song "Space Jam" I believe is the title credit, which they start over a music video very early on after we meet. Young Michael Jordan talking to his dad, who, of course, has his own, you know, unfortunate uh, tragedy that happened to him a few years prior. But then they go into that Space Jam song, which I kind of sort of remember again. I, like you saw, I've seen this movie one time, but they run the credits where they're running like every Tom, Dick and Harry that's in this movie. I, I added this up. It's a three minute and 15 second credit scene off the top. So if you haven't seen this movie in a while and you're happy to listen to this podcast, I'm telling you when that's, when the credits hit, just tell, you know, tell Siri to skip forward three minutes because, uh, or go get a snack. Yes, absolutely. And the transitions and it's so hard to read. And then you're like, who's this guy? What does he do? I don't know. Here we go. Flash, 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 done. Next scene, clip, basketball. It was so fast. It's so it was kind of aggravating to the eyes. You're like, okay, I, I just, I need to just take a nap for about three minutes. The, the other part that doesn't age well is that this movie is seriously trapped in the nineties. I, I got to ask Kristen, like the Jim Rome being in this Ahmad Rashad. I mean, some of the more obscure basketball players, do you know, Sean Bradley is Sean Bradley, like an important figure in your sports history? No, <laughs> just no. <laughs> oh man. No, I, 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 okay, I but I will I say, so for all the talent that, that was in this movie, I was just lost on how they came up with this this plot. Like the names and the sports oh. figures, like you said, that they cast all these guys and they had, you know, quote unquote, supporting roles. And I think Larry Bird had, again, maybe two lines in this whole film. 
Like, what do I, I think the budget was something around 60 million, 80 million I saw. And I, I was just dumbfounded how they did not find a better way to, to weave these guys into the plot line. Something I want to do in each of these episodes, the pitch room. I want to go into the pitch room and I want us to try to pitch this concept to the studio, right? Like, how do you convince somebody to make this movie? Because, Ooh. you know, I mean, for, like, first of all, all right, uh, we'll, we'll just, we're going to role play here. <clears throat> so, hey, uh, we've got an idea that we think uh, kids are going to love. They love Michael Jordan, and we want Michael Jordan to be in his first major movie. And uh, Chris is going to tell you about the cartoon stars that are uh, in this movie. So I'm pitching? Yeah. Pitch me. Let's sell me on it. The ever so popular Looney Tune characters need help from Michael Jordan to win a game of basketball against the Monstars, who have been taken captive over their ruler of Moron Mountain, whose name I also did not get. I don't think they ever said it, did they? I don't did know. they ever? I don't think they ever said it. It's Danny DeVito. I don't. I don't think his character name is. Uh, it's not a very well developed character. No. The big guy with the cigar. They needed help, um, yeah, to get to get their uh, to win the basketball game, to get the NBA players' talents back, which they have stolen to entertain moron mountain fans through Michael Jordan. Oh, okay, Mister Mister Studio Executive, uh, what what questions do you have for us? Oh my gosh! You I think really I laid it out. So, I, I laid it out so straightforward. I oh don't my know gosh. There be any questions in that plot? Like, and so where where is their talent? Where is it harnessed in? Like, oh, where is it? Where does it go? NBA talent is harnessed in a magical glowing ball. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No. Yeah. That sounds ridiculous. That was sucked <laughs> from them mid game. Actually. Oh. So now all of a sudden you got Charles Barkley or whoever that they just can't play basketball. Patrick Ewing cannot dribble. He just can't Which, figure it out. Interesting. Yeah, so so yeah, this movie's going to have Patrick Ewing, we've got Charles Barkley, we got Muggsy Bogues who people love. Uh, you know, these guys happen to be also David Falk who's an executive producer on this movie, Michael Jordan's agent. You might find that most of these guys are also David Falk's clients, so that may may just be a coincidence that he was his agent and he got them in this movie that he's a producer of, but uh, but, you know, what, what other questions do you have about the plot? Because it sounds pretty buttoned up to me. Well, we, we need we need another side character, don't we? We need a side character that's going to kind of, you know, maybe uh, tally Jordan um, and kind of help him act out through some of these scenes, right? So who who would that be? Well, I, I could tell you that we, we tried to get Michael J. Fox to be in this movie, but he turned us down. Uh, and so, but we got Wayne Knight, who I think people remember uh, from Jurassic Park, you know? He's Wayne Jurassic Knight was good. Yeah. Yeah. D Dennis Nedry. So we got him. Uh, you know, kids love uh, Nedry. Uh, 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 you didn't say the magic word. We got that guy. And uh, we got, you know, uh, we got Chicago super fan Bill, Bill Murray, who's going to be, uh, he's going to have some lines in this movie. He's going to do a thing. Fantastic. He's going to, yeah, he's, he's sitting there for comic relief. You'll find that he doesn't have a lot of jokes. Like he doesn't have really anything that you'll probably laugh at, but people love Bill Murray. I want to, so we touched on Charles Barkley, who I actually think is pretty good in this movie. Like he's, I think he would have been a good lead. You know, he's got a little edge to him. Michael Jordan, pretty Pretty like generic Michael Jordan, you know. Uh, but Charles Barkley, pretty good in this. This was an interesting time in Arizona sports because you got this movie comes out in November 1996. The Suns are super front and center in this movie. They're in the first uh, NBA basketball scene. And then a month later, Jerry Maguire comes out. So that features Rod Tidwell, the fictitious star wide out from the Arizona Cardinals. So this is basically like peak time for... Arizona sports, I think, in like the world. This is probably the most anybody in the world has ever heard about the Phoenix Suns or at the time the Phoenix Cardinals. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I mean, it, I like Danny Ainge. He has a few little one liners in there too. And he's kind of, and then I don't know if they use the dummy Ainge later on. It, it, when, when his back is turned to the camera, I was like, is that, is that really Danny Ainge or is that not? It was, it was kind of confusing, but uh, I thought Charles Barkley did a great job too. And, and even at the end, trying to get everything back and losing his confidence and getting beat up by the girl, essentially getting trash talked by the girl. I thought he, I thought he did a very solid job. 
Do you think Danny Ainge is so big that there was a stunt Danny Ainge? I think like there a- was a stunt Danny Ainge. I really do. I really do. Maybe it was a different day of filming and Danny wasn't available, so they just they shoved in another stunt double. <laughs> He's like, we got Jordan, we got Ewing, we got Charles Barkley, but Danny Ainge just can't seal the deal for casting. Yeah. The One of the things we're going to talk about in this podcast, because I think one of the great things about sports movies is, you know, one of the reasons we like sports is, you don't know who's going to win from week to week. That's one of the reasons we like it. You watch a game, you don't know who's going to win. A sports movie, like it's A, it's preordained, and B, it doesn't change no matter how many times you watch it. So for us, we're going to dive into the games themselves, the the action themselves. And one of the questions I want to ask each time we do one of these episodes is, what's real and what's fake in this? I mean... I, I don't even know how to even tackle that with a movie like this because there is so much unreal going on. Uh, the only real thing is Michael Jordan's ability on the court. We all already know it. We've seen it. We've we've lived it. So that's the real thing. Outside of that, and the player intros. The player intros are pretty real. You know, uh, outside of coming out of a tunnel instead of from the bench, I didn't understand that part. Uh, and then they didn't even introduce the monsters. They were just like, "And here's the monsters," and they came out, and that was it. They didn't get individual player introductions. So, uh, but so that was the realest thing. The most unreal. I mean, the ending. Come on now, Michael Jordan's arm can stretch how long now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and just uh, drop it. That's what I thought was so unrealistic as well. You're going to paint the picture that Michael Jordan is, and he is the superstar. However, when it comes down to the final seconds, he he can't actually just use his human like abilities to hit the game winner. They you know they had yeah. to stretch that arm. Like, oh, just I actually some dunk. I, I actually have that down as the most realistic part of the movie because he has every chance to pass the ball and doesn't. <laughs> so it's like the ultimate ball hog move. Like he could have given it back to Bugs or to the female bunny or to Bill Murray, but instead he's like, I'm going to stretch my arm halfway across the court because I'm Michael Jordan. I mean, it, the what's in the balance though is him going to work on some planet he's never been to before as a slave essentially for the rest of his life. Yeah, I'm taking that shot too. <laughs> I'm not leaving it in Bugs Bunny's hands. <laughs> Yeah, Bugs Bunny, not, I mean, for a lead in this movie, not a great basketball player, by the way. No. No, took a backseat to Jordan. I, I wrote, I, I wrote uh, this, I found this on the internet. I found this interesting. The Monstars' names are Pound, Bang, Not, Bupkis, and Blanco, but they never mention their names. Hmm. Yeah, why but do they, they never mention their names? There's probably some uh, like Space Jam fan fiction out there where people get into like the characters more if you want to know more about Bupkis. Because there was a point when they took the NBA players' talents. I was thinking that they actually kind of morphed into certain characteristics of those guys. And I, I was wondering, you know, am I just looking at this green guy differently or does that really look like, you know, Charles Right. Like the, yeah, like the tall uh, blue guy, I think, who's kind of – slow uh i thought he was like supposed to be like sean bradley and but there really wasn't a monster that was mugsy bogues there should have been like a you know well no bugsy Bogues. yeah like th- those guys they should have had like a ewing one i don't know what would ewing's as a monster been like uh, he was just one of the other dominant ones that's all it was pretty much him him larry johnson and and, Ch- and chuck were were the three dominant ones and then they had the the big tall goofy one which i thought was a a perfect rep- representation of Sean Bradley. If you've ever seen him or met him, he just seems like that kind of a dopey guy. <laughs> I have something else that's totally unrealistic. How this, film, how this film ended, you know, when the monsters shrink back down to regular size and they say, well, we don't want to go back. And Jordan says, we don't have to go back. And I'm like, so all along, you you know, you couldn't have figured out when you were big, you didn't have to follow this guy's orders. Like this, this game never needed to even happen. Yeah. Which was half the movie, by the way, the game. Half the movie didn't need to happen. Once Jordan just said, you don't have to go back to Moron Mountain. I thought you were going to go with the flying UFO into the baseball stadium and Jordan coming out and everybody being okay with it. Like, oh yeah, here he is. He's here to play. Oh, that's what we're cool with. Like nobody's going to freak out about this. It's a UFO people. Hello. I, I also wanted on that note, I was very bothered by Jordan. You know, he's playing golf with Bill Murray and Larry Bird and he hits a 
hole in one and get sucked into the Looney Tunes universe. Yeah. And like he's freaking out and screaming and he lands and he ends up in like a crappy gym, like a crappy cartoon gym. Super fine with being sucked into like the cartoon universe. Like if you redo this movie, Michael Jordan's got to be like, what the f- where the f- am I? Like, yeah. why are you cartoons? Like, you know, I, and maybe you need an athlete with a little more, like these are these are notes for you, LeBron, and uh, the rest of you guys are making that movie. Is that if you get sucked into a cartoon universe, like it's allowed, you're allowed to be upset or perplexed and not just be like, hey, cool, I'm wearing big baggy clothes. I'm Michael Jordan. Are we well, maybe find- that goes are- back to our acting conversation. Maybe they did prompt him to try and give some reaction, and he just simply couldn't do it. Maybe are that we- was him freaking out. Correct. Are we going to find out that the real reason why the NBA was in the bubble was because LeBron needed to work on Space Jam 2 at Disney? I know. when they were, Well, since we've learned, you know, after watching The Last Dance, that all that Warner Brothers footage, you know, that there was real legitimate NBA pickup basketball going on right there. And we didn't get to see any of that. Oh, yeah. There's, there's highlights out there. But I mean... To, to see now, like, that's how much time they spent there filming this movie. And, uh, you know, just kind of went like, oh, th- I yeah, don't this, know. This that was, would made for, like, a good scene in Space Jam. They had filmed this post um, him getting s- swept by Orlando um, and Shaq and Horace Grant and all that. Um, and so he worked out that entire summer while filming this movie. They called it the Jordan Dome. He had weights on the side and uh, Reggie Miller and Jawan Howard and, you know, just the NBA elite would always go out there and, and play pickup basketball games. And then the next year, Jordan was back and won a title. So that was pretty so, cool. Yeah, well, to your point, I would like to see some NBA bubble highlights in Space Jam 2. There it is. I would like to see that. Uh, these movies, Hall of Fame quotes, they're uh, – has anybody got a Hall of Fame quote or any quote that this isn't a movie that I think you can quote? Other no, than, you can't quote it. I, I, all I got is "What's up, Doc?" because that's all I heard like eighteen thousand times throughout the movie from Bugs Bunny. It's like his only line. Again, I just I I resort to the soundtrack. I think Space Jam. I just start singing. I believe I can fly. I more like the cliches of them in the movie. Um, you know, like even the very beginning with the father and son oh, yeah. shooting, like it's just, you know, so cliche. And then you mentioned it earlier and I, I, I actually laughed when I saw this. Imagine Michael Jordan actually laying down in a hotel in Birmingham, Alabama, eating McDonald's. Like really? <laughs> That's not See, I can picture that. But he's totally, well, he was sponsored by McDonald's at the time, along with Coke and Gatorade and all this other stuff. And then and then your guy from uh, Jurassic Park went on this like, hey, then we can swing by and get this and we can go get some Gatorade and you can eat your Wheaties. And we and he plugged every single Jordan product <laughs> on the way out. So I'm kind of thinking that's why the movie was actually made. I don't think it was a kid's movie. I think it was just an endorsement collaboration oh. on all fronts. Are you, are you are you trying to say this isn't high art, Kristen? That this movie isn't a artistic well, endeavor by as the folks you know, that I'm not quite the movie connoisseur that you are. Uh, what? Uh, yeah. How much money did this movie end up making? I, I looked this up because I was because I'm fascinated by this. It's the highest grossing basketball movie of all time. Oh my god! Oh, that's just disrespectful. That just hurts so much. It made $90 million domestic on like an $80 million budget. And it made, uh, I think, uh, another $140 million internationally. So this, so they made plenty of money on this. Here's your top 10 highest grossing uh, basketball movies of all time. Space Jam, number one. White Men Can't Jump, number two. Coach Carter, like Mike, does, does not have Michael Jordan. Glory Road, Uncle Drew, which came out, uh, what, last year or 2018. Semi-Pro with Will Ferrell, Eddie. Hoosiers and then number 10, love and basketball. Actually, let's go, let's go one more. Number 11, Air Bud. It's not a great list. No, it's a terrible list. And four of those top six should just be burned off the face of the earth. Yeah, uh, 41% on Rotten Tomatoes. I think this movie has. It was not super well received by critics, but again, the guy that directed this is a commercial director. Um, you know, th- like he had mostly worked on Michael Jackson music videos. I think I read he had won more awards for directing commercials. Joe Pitka is the gentleman's name. And if you look at what else Joe Pitka has done for movies, you'll be looking for a while. I mean, this movie was a cash grab and it grabbed cash. That's 
I mean, we're talking about it. It's 24 years later and we're talking about it. So good job, Jordan. You know, I think it's definitely one of those movies where if you saw it the first time and you, and you lived the next 24 years until now, you're probably looking back and you're like, Oh yeah, I remember with space jam and you probably have fond memories of it. But if you have to watch it like we did now, thinking about what you remember from back then, you're severely disappointed in what you actually had to watch and uh, relive because it's not that great of a movie. And I can understand the 40% score on Rotten Tomatoes. I think that's why everybody talks about it and remembers it, but nobody actually sits down to go rewatch it. On this podcast, I want to talk about sequels. This one actually has a sequel coming out. I think it's maybe the only one we're going to do that we know will go down that way. How do you fix it? I mean, you got LeBron, you've got Clay Thompson, you got Anthony Davis, you've got a bunch of WNBA stars, including Diana Taurasi. So how do you fix the sequel? How do you make it so that we're not sitting around here going like, because LeBron can act, by the way. He can act. He was in Trainwreck is a good movie. LeBron is one of the best parts of uh, yeah. Trainwreck. That's a pretty good movie. But how do you fix it? What would no. you do? Uh, I mean, we just mimic real life, right? Put all the great players on LeBron's team and smash the other teams. And then that's it. That's the end of the movie. It takes 15 minutes. It's done. Get your money and get out. LeBron's do, we know, is- do we know the extent of which the sequel is going to be similar? Is it the same, the same plot line and all that? But they have not released a lot about it. Don Cheadle plays a villain. We know that. We know the NBA players that are in it. And we know some of the voice actors that are reprising some of the roles of the Looney Tunes, which I think is one of the major problems because, again, you can you can shove – you know, they, they try – I love the Muppets. Jim Henson's my idol. They've tried to relaunch the Muppets a bunch of times, and I don't think that it has really taken flight. The Muppets are not a big deal now like they were when I was a kid. I don't think you can make the Looney Tunes. You had your run. So let's replace the Looney Tunes. Who should LeBron like? Who, who does he need to be in the, like Mickey Mouse and you know like the Disney characters? Like what would what would work now? I don't know. Maybe replace them with South Park kids. <laughs> that's <laughs> let's, let's, that turn this, from let's turn a, this thing up. That goes, goes from, from a PG, PG to an R. Yeah, to an R sure. very quickly. For sure. Yeah, yeah. They can kill off Kenny. I don't know. Dunk on him, he explodes. He kills. They killed Kenny, and then they go back at him. Like it'd be awesome. I don't think there's any cartoons that are taking the world by storm these days. Yeah, I don't know what the kids watch nowadays. You gotta tell us that, Josh. What what are the kids watching nowadays? You know. Well, like I mean, like you know, I mean, in our house, like you know, Pokemon is still uh, that's the biggest media property in the world. It's owned one third by Nintendo, and it's owned two thirds by the Pokemon company, but. They kind of did that with the live action thing with Ryan Reynolds and Detective Pikachu, but I don't, I don't think there's a sports movie there um, in the same way. And, and yeah, I, I, correct I mean, me if it, I'm wrong. A lot of a lot of uh, the fan base who would watch Space Jam are not interested in Pikachu, and vice versa. Not necessarily, and that's again like ESPN owns Disney, the NBA. They're playing the bubble there. Like to me, it's a Disney property. Whether it's like Marvel characters or something like. Maybe LeBron needs the Avengers to jump in. I mean, those Avengers movies make a gajillion dollars every time. Like, you're trying to tell me you wouldn't watch that, you know? Or go get some Pixar characters, get like Mr. Incredible to like, you know, play the play the post. Yeah, I mean, any anything besides cartoons, you know? Give me the, I, it just it just doesn't it doesn't it doesn't play well. Give me the little give me the little fat kid from Up with the balloons. You know, use him. He could be in this movie. <laughs> But then again, but then again, with these terrible cartoons intertwined in the movie, isn't that what makes it so different? Again, it's would you right. watch it? Like, I think people are going to watch it because LeBron's in it and they exactly. want to see how this goes. But, you know, you're, you know, the, the true mark of a good movie is how many times will you go back to watch it? Right. But That's, we already you know. learned that Space Jam was not created to be the to be a good movie it was cool. yeah but people went back to go watch it multiple times because maybe they saw it by themselves then they brought their kids and there wasn't anything else to do like people have technology at the you know at their fingertips and there's plenty of other things that people can consume their time with so it's a little bit di- different from 24 years ago back in 1996 nobody had a cell phone you were lucky if you had a pager if you had a pager you were a boss or a drug dealer and that was it <laughs> so <laughs> so uh i'm <laughs> So you're as resident Michael Jordan fan here, Saul, how do we feel about this movie and Michael Jordan's legacy? Is it just like, I mean, you, you love the guy when, when I say space jam, what comes to mind? Uh, another notch in his belt, 
Like that's just hey, it's just one of those things you just got to check off, like to make you like a real superstar. Like you're bigger than life, right? And Michael Jordan at that time was bigger than life. This is just part of his his arsenal of things that you know build up into who he is and what he ended up being. And so you know, with the endorsements, now the movies. Uh, I don't believe he was ever. He never sang, which thank the Lord he never sang. But he was in a music video with Michael Jack, uh, Michael Jackson, Jam. Um, so you know, it's it's all good. I'm okay with this. Did he plus, do this he, move? Plus, right. he made a lot of money off of it. Like, I'm not gonna hate on that. Get your hands on, lace up your Nikes, grab your Wheaties and your Gatorade, and we'll pack. We'll pick up a Big Mac on the way to the ballpark. Yep. The, the dude knew how to make money and people knew how to make money off of him. The guy was a cash machine. Was he, did he do this? I don't even know this, but maybe he made this movie. You think about like 95, 96 Shaq had started making movies. That seemed like the, one of the first athletes in a while that was like headline in a movie, right? Yeah, like blue chips yeah. come out. Kazam had come out. Yep. Yeah. Those are the two that, that I can remember. And blue chips came out before Kazam, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I think that came out like 94, 95 while Jordan was on his hiatus. So maybe that kind of pushed him in this direction. Who knows? This was um, in the list of movies that we will probably review and look at and and recap. I'm hoping that this is as bad as it gets. I have fears that it won't be. I'm going to say this is probably top, uh, bottom 10 sports movies, maybe of all time. That hurts me. That hurts me. Wow. Like, sorry. I'm sorry. Like, like Blockbuster Video. It's a relic of the 90s. <laughs> You picked I, this movie for us to review. Yes, you, I wanted that to be clear. Josh to wanted to lead off with this one, so let's. Let, I want to hear your insight as well, Josh. Well, first of all, there's a bunch of things going on in this. One is that I wanted. I remember seeing this and feeling very underwhelmed. That's how I mostly remember. And but I do remember being hyped to go see it just because I thought the special effects looked cool. I thought you know it was kind of like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which is kind of the I think the most famous live action animated movie, you know, that that got Oscar nominations, I believe. So this did not get Oscar nominations. Uh, maybe actually, uh, I believe I could fly, I think got a nomination, but I, I wanted to revisit it because a we're talking because there's a sequel coming out. I think people are thinking about space jam right now. And I wanted to know, you know, you go back to a lot of these movies. I think this is one of the things I want to do with this podcast is you go back to a lot of these movies and you go was as good as I can remember, because there are some movies that I want to touch on that have sad endings that still mess with me that I still, these are fictitious teams. The Friday night lights team was based on a true story. Yeah. They don't win the state championship. And when I was watching that movie, I was sure they were going to win it the way that it was cut together. It still messes with me that they, that they lost and that's how it's written. So I wanted to know if this movie, you know, sports movies affect me. It's why I want to do this podcast. This one doesn't, doesn't trip me the way a lot of them do, but I wanted to know if there was, if it was just distance or maybe I was a traumatized Suns fan and I just didn't like Michael Jordan. But um, it turns out there's a reason why I didn't, uh, I got free rentals at Blockbuster Video and I, I didn't pick this one up. So maybe that's what needed to happen. Maybe Michael Jordan just needed to lose to the Monstars and we would be talking about this forever and ever and ever. No, no. Why would you even do that to kids? Life, man. <laughs> Don't we got enough of that in 2020, Kristen? Jesus. <laughs> Ooh, exactly. You got to you gotta learn the hard way early. Oh, this, this is supposed to be escapism. <laughs> All right, guys. Our first crack ever at the Real MVP podcast. Kristen Saul, thank you for indulging me with Space Jam. And we will be back soon with the next installment. Thanks, guys.